Let's pray together. So God, as we have heard these scriptures, these sacred words, we are thankful for your spirit here which guides us. Speak into our hearts, speak into our minds. Help this scripture to be written into our lives so that we not only hear the word, but we live it. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, one time there was this woman, and she was just absolutely anxious. Uh, She came into this divorce lawyer's office, and frantically she told him, I have to have a divorce from my husband immediately. And the lawyer asked, well, do you have any grounds? And she said, yes, about five acres. (laughs) Um, He said, I mean, do you have a grudge? And she said, no, just a carport. And then the lawyer asked, well, does he beat you up? And the woman replied, no, I get up before he does. And so exasperated, now the attorney demanded, madam, why do you want to have a divorce from your husband? And she said, oh, that's easy, because it's impossible to communicate with that man. (laughs) Communicate, communicate, communicate. It's so important in any relationship, and yet when it comes to communicating our relationship with God to any of the rest of the world, many of us kind of take that stance that it's become impossible. Yes, we're going to talk about some dirty words in our Christian walk today, but don't worry, they're not four-letter words, but instead words like evangelism and witnessing. And yes, they come with some heavy baggage and some pretty bad reps especially in things that we've seen and observed. You know, it seems like over the years that I've seen that those who are attracted to the United Methodist Church, our denomination, our, our brand, our branch of the Christian family tree, it seems like many of us have no trouble going out and serving in the world. We can get our minds around that. We can love others by love in action. But when it comes to talking about our relationship to Christ as to why we do it, Many of us, well, we would rather go silent. And certainly there are really a whole host of reasons, comfort reasons, why we don't communicate. One is, well, rejection. What are people going to do? How are they going to react? So what I say, what I share, leaves me kind of vulnerable. Or two, the bad experiences that we've seen, we've observed. I mean, we don't want to be the kind of person that we've seen almost kind of like grab somebody, throttle them by the collar, get in their face and say, sinner, are you saved? And there are certainly also those people that you just kind of hate to be around because it seems like no matter what the topic, you know that they're going to manipulate it somehow into giving their personal testimony. Or then there is the person who seems to to almost brag. They want to collect numbers about how many people they've saved today. And all those examples can leave a bad taste in our mouths. It's as if they leave you feeling like, well, it's more about that particular person than genuine concern for others. And we also many times don't want to go against kind of that cultural value that sees faith as kind of a personal thing that, yeah, you know, hey, live and let live. And uh, hey, that's great that it works for you, but keep it to yourself. And we also worry that in such a pluralistic world that somehow, well, we might offend or be disrespectful if someone has a different belief system. Oh, yes, there's lots of reasons we've gone silent. But the problem of staying comfortable with that is that it ignores that a relationship with Jesus, a a, a desire to be one of his students, to be a follower, to be a disciple, means we must listen to him. And what he communicates to us is that as we are saved, as we realize what that means and as it has an impact in our lives, we realize we've been given a great gift. And it isn't just to be held, you know, here between you and me, God, for my benefit only, it's to be shared. And what he communicates is that each of us have a calling on our lives to continue to build God's world just the way it should be, the way life should be. And we're to continue to write the story with our lives. 
And so I want us to look at our example today in our text because it begins, as we heard, with Philip. And if we read just prior to the, the story today, we realize that Philip is really quite busy and successfully is reaching out to people in Samaria when he gets the call, this message to go to that long, lonely stretch of road heading south out of Jerusalem to Gaza. It's a desert, and it's deserted. And yet we don't read about any description of, of more pressing business or any kind of excuses or Philip saying, hey, God, you got to explain to me all the details or I'm not in. Philip simply sets out. He's ready, like the description of the Old Testament prophets, he's set to go at, at God's beck and call. And it's along this way, this, this lonely road, that he meets this Ethiopian. And all we really hear about him is that he's a eunuch and that he's a prestigious minister of the court of Candace. Now, that's not a name, that's not our senior pastor, uh, but it's a title, like the Pharaoh of Egypt. He worked in the court of Can Candace, which means he worked for the current queen of the Ethiopians, in charge, really, of their treasury department. Other than that, we're not given much of the man's backstory, but we are told he had traveled all the way up and over into Jerusalem, perhaps on some business for his boss, or perhaps, maybe, to find out a little bit more about his life, his identity. You know, some historians have observed that in the first century, it, in the Middle East, it seemed like really a time of people doing some honest soul searching and seeking. So many of them were tired of all these, these gods for every situation and particular God for this and a particular God for that. And on top of these pantheons, there were also the lifestyles, so many loose morals, and many were searching for something that offered hope, that made sense, that gave direction in life. And at least one of these reasons that he's gone all that way is that we're told he's gone there to worship God. And apparently, he makes this pilgrimage to the Jerusalem temple in order to attend services there. And this day, he's returning from such an experience, and that official is in his chariot. And, you know, when we kind of first picture it, we probably think, you know, there's this, this, this lonely guy on the road, you know, making this long stretch all on his own. But in such an office and of such prestige, he was probably in this whole huge entourage, not only for his security, but you know, the, the, the ability to have assistance for such an important position. But he is alone in his chariot. And this man is studying scripture and he's looking for answers. And that's when Philip gets the nudge from the Holy Spirit to go catch up with his chariot and stay close. And when I picture this, I'm hoping that this caravan was going along at a leisurely pace. Otherwise, I picture Philip just trying to run, run aside this uh, chariot, trying to catch his breath. But here he is alongside this official, and he overhears him reading out loud, which really was the custom, uh, common custom of the day when studying Scripture. And as they kind of sort of share this road experience together, Philip simply asks him the question, do you get it? Do you get what you're reading? And that's when the court official says that insightful question, well, how can I unless someone explains it to me? And at this point, he invites Philip up in the carriage to travel with him and sit with him. And there they are. They're, they're talking together. Philip's answering his questions. He's taking the opportunity to just introduce him to Jesus and what he's done. And in the end, it caught the passion of this man immediately to be baptized that very day. So what's the takeaway from this scripture? Could we perhaps see a better model, a better way by Philip's example to not give up on evangelism and witnessing, to not go silent? Because what do we see? First, that Philip is listening. His radar is out there. It's on to look for people that God will put into his life. That every day that there might be someone that God intentionally puts in our own lives, someone that we can help serve and share if we're looking. So we have to ask ourselves, are we starting out our days with asking God for guidance, asking for an awareness to respond?
to the people around us. And next, we also see that Philip is available. We all lead busy lives. But again, if we let our agendas take the priority, if we let ourselves be so busy, so overstretched, so filled up, then we don't and usually won't obediently respond to those messy interruptions of our schedule, of those God nudges, or be able to respond to people in need. We do become too busy to allow enough space, enough wiggle room to give of our time and our presence. But Philip, he felt the leading of the Spirit to to go away, even from his ministry, even from his good service acts, even his church work, to be available for what God needed him to do right then and there in that situation. So it did. It meant he had to rearrange his schedule. It meant he maybe had to let others handle things now, maybe even cancel a few meetings. God wanted a different priority that day from Philip, and Philip followed. He made himself available to the leading of the Spirit. But what else? Philip traveled along that day with this man, You know, notice he doesn't just come up on him and just start preaching at him. Instead, he was given an opportunity to listen to this man, to hear about his struggles, to hear this man's confusion, his questions, his doubts. He let the man basically tell his story first. And when when the man asked, then he said, can I tell you about Jesus? Which leads me to my last example. You see, when it came to share the gospel, Philip used the scouting motto that we kind of just talked about, be prepared. And this idea is fleshed out in scriptures, and particularly in 1 Peter 3.15, where it says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. You see, Philip had spent some time in study and reflection. And friends, too many of us are comfortable being biblically illiterate. And there are so many encouragements in the scriptures to not remain immature in our faith, that we're supposed to keep on growing our whole life long. And we're to do so that we don't fall prey for whatever is the latest whims or fads or falsehoods or even dangerous misleadings that can come along when we start, when we stop learning and living our faith. And so I want to challenge all of us. I mean, we live in a day of such easy access to so many resources, books and DVDs and online resources. We really don't have that much for an excuse, but even better, Even better than that, do it with a group so that you can have the benefit of journeying together, knowing their life experiences and what it brings to the gospel, challenging you, asking you other questions that maybe you hadn't thought about, and it makes it come alive and we grow that much more. But please also hear the other part of it because I see so many of us also go silent when it comes telling the story of Jesus, because we think that witnessing and evangelizing means that you have to be some kind of, I don't know, like a a biblical scholar. Or we're so afraid that our life has to be perfectly together before we can kind of tell others what's going on. Uh, After all, we might be seen as hypocrites. But it's here that we see Philip didn't just study scripture. He reflected on it. He connected where Scripture and Jesus' story had intersected in his own life. I really don't think that what most people are searching for nowadays is just knowing more about Jesus, but hearing personal experience of Jesus in our own lives. Where did God's story through Jesus intersect with our story? How has that relationship changed our story to where we can humbly and lovingly communicate the joy, the hope, the peace, and the love that we found. So if you're tempted to comfortably go or remain silent when it comes to evangelism or witnessing, remember our encounter today, that stranger along the road, that 
person also could represent a large number of the people that we encounter today. Maybe they're well-educated, good people, successful people, but really lacking for something to give them life meaning. And all without really knowing the story of Christ and what you have experienced. And that question that that man asks is really one that should speak to us to really make sure that we haven't stopped communicating. Because he says, how can I know unless someone guides my steps? Someone explains it to me. What Jesus calls us to do is to continue the life-giving message written with our own lives. You know, my brother-in-law recently experienced this. He's the pastor out at Gold Canyon United Methodist Church, and he had this illustrated recently in his own congregation. It came through a reluctant man who recently was challenged to do exactly that, be prepared to tell someone about Jesus should God nudge him. And sure enough, after he kind of remembers, he recalls that of just going, Ugh, that makes me cringe. But he found himself on a hiking trail that following week. And he came across a stranger on this trail. And that in itself was already kind of a, a weird thing to have happen. Because he said, hardly anybody ever goes out there. It's so remote. It's just really off the beaten path. And at first, he assumed this guy was just somehow coincidentally out there like he was, just taking in nature. But he noticed the man was looking out over this gorge, this whole area, and he also noticed that he was standing awfully close to a cliff's edge. And the man seemed lost in thought, not really taking in any of the view. And he said, quite honestly... My first impression was to walk on by. Uh, it felt kind of weird. But then he remembered that challenge, that challenge about being prepared. And his next thought was to check on him. And what unraveled next was a man who slowly opened up about all sorts of things, things that had led up to this moment, things that had culminated in his kind of seeing no purpose, feeling as if, if he were to die, would it really make a difference? Would anybody even care? And yet, he also found the curiosity of running into anybody right at this very moment when he was going to end his life in this intentionally chosen secluded area and time. And it was exactly that expression of curiosity that that man from the Gold Canyon Church asked, hey, can we talk some more <laughs> away from the edge? And he shared how he felt that this was no coincidence. And lovingly and humbly, he shared where he had found hope in his life through what Jesus had done in his own experiences. He shared the many times where he could recall how he could have easily at first seeing how people had been placed in his life, that it kind of journeyed with him. But then he saw beneath that the hand of God, that God's presence was with him at so many places. And not just the places of joy, but the places of, of self-doubt, the places that are hard and make life so difficult to go on. And yet he shared again the joy of seeing himself through God's eyes of how valued he was and hoping that this man would also begin to have those kinds of experiences knowing how unique and wonderful masterpiece he was. And so this man from that church said to my brother-in-law, Fred, he said, you know, I saw the reality of the difference of sharing the gospel that day. I saw firsthand the importance really of sharing, of witnessing to others. It is life-saving and it's life-giving. And you know, that's why we do it. That's why we do it even through our shyness and our fear and even our discomfort. We do it because 2,000 years ago, the Word became flesh and dwelt right here among us. 
And the early Christian church made this, this, this tremendous impact on the world. And it was also that through the book of Acts that we know that this mark upon the world was not made by Christians who were so popular and so successful and were so numerically superior to the general crowd. No, they were none of these things. They were just a handful, a handful of ordinary average folk who were anything but impressive. But yet, they were with and under that word made flesh. And it made them different. They'd been with Jesus, and it was that difference, that change in their attitude, that that change in the very being of their life that made the impact. And so, folks, the word is now here with us. Our time is here with us to add our chapter to this greatest love story of all time. And we will remember not just to live it, but also to be able to tell it. And out of all the witnesses, out of all the glorious company that we read about in scriptures or in history about the apostles and the martyrs and the missionaries of old, we're now the ones who are left. It's our turn. We have been saved and called into life, and it's a true life with hope and purpose. And rather than some dreaded drudgery, no, we're given a wonderful opportunity, the ability to share the life that Christ has given to us. And through God's grace, we invite others to join in that dance, to dance with the one who offers the way, the truth, and the life. Amen?